let's talk about statins. Let's talk about the history of statins, where they came from. We talked about what they do, how did they get here, and what's the deal? Basically, the diet hard hypothesis started in 1913 with a gentleman who fed herbivorous rabbits cholesterol and saw they got atherosclerosis. So since then, we've been obsessed with cholesterol, except rabbits aren't supposed to get cholesterol in their diet because they're herbivores, and the atheromas they had don't look like human atheromas at a histological level, and rabbits are not humans, and we know that if you feed humans pure cholesterol, they don't necessarily develop atheromas. This is what we use to treat smith lemliopet syndrome. But nevertheless, there's been a fascination with cholesterol, probably fueled by people like Ansel Keys uh, and the like, and it has led to many problematic paradigms within Western medicine. In 1987, the first statin from Merck was approved. This is lovastatin, originally derived from a fungus. You may be familiar with red yeast rice or monocolon K, which is the substance found in red yeast rice. It's also found in oyster mushrooms and a few other things in nature. It is a mycotoxin. <laughs> lovastatin is a mycotoxin. It's in red yeast rice as a mycotoxin. It's there to kill the things that are eating it. It's there to dissuade the things that are eating it. Think about that the next time you eat oyster mushrooms. Cooking an oyster mushroom probably denatures the statin that's in there, the lovastatin, but that is a mycotoxin in mushrooms. This mirrors my perspective on plants. Why are you eating leaves and stems and roots and seeds that are full of defense chemicals when you could be eating the most sought after foods for humans on the planet, organs, meat, fruit, honey, raw dairy, much less toxic. Why, do I not, why am I not a fan of mushrooms? This is the reason mycotoxins, mushrooms clearly defend themselves against predation, both red yeast rice, which is a fungus that grows on a, presumably a type of rice, and oyster mushrooms have monocolon K. This was the first statin to be patented by Merck in 1987. It's important to back up seven years and realize that in 1980, Ronald Reagan slashed funding to the NIH for research, which paved the way for pharmaceuticals to fund much of the research that is done in the medical space today. This is something that I find lamentable. And I think that it influences the way that doctors are taught and the way that we conceive of things within medicine. The majority of studies that are done in medicine are funded by pharmaceutical companies. Is there a conflict of interest here? You bet there is. And as I will mention now, the problem with this is that often trials are not published and side effects are not discussed. So. With regard to statins, this was unbelievable when I read about it. There is an organization that is headed by Sir Rory Collins of Oxford that has all of the raw data for all of the statin trials. And that raw data regarding side effects is not available to any third-party researchers who wish to examine the true rates of statin side effects. Don't believe me? This is a pretty incredible article from Marianne Damasi, Statin Wars, Have We Been Misled About the Evidence and Narrative Review? Here she talks about, a prominent researchers at Oxford University formed an alliance called the Cholesterol Treatment Trialist, CTT Collaborative. Sir Professor Rory Collins, this group of researchers began periodically publishing their own reviews of statin data from clinical trials. The reviews were dogmatic, according to Marion DeMassi's editorial, uh, about advocating wider use of statins in healthy people, primary prevention, which we already talked about in this podcast, at least according to the 4S study, um, not a lot of good data there. An accompanying editorial argued that everyone over 50 should be taking a statin, regardless of their cholesterol levels, and if implemented in the USA would lead to 64 million people more than half of the US population over 35 starting statin therapy. One prominent cardiologist even wrote an article in Journal of American Cardiology. This is one we talked about earlier, saying that statins should be at McDonald's. Uh, some doctors have even suggested grape-flavored chewable statins, which were offered by Pfizer a number of years ago for kids, and there was a debate about the USA putting statins in the water supply. But what do we do when the CTT collaboration does not allow anyone else to look at the data for statin side effects? Interestingly, as Marianne Damasi notes in this article, the CTT collaboration is a branch of the Clinical Trial Service Unit at Oxford, uh, demands the principal investigators of the statin trials release the raw data on efficacy and side effects. There is growing unease that the CTSU has received over 260 million pounds in research funding from the pharmaceutical industry, the vast majority of it from manufacturers of cholesterol-lowering drugs. They will not let third parties look at the side effects of statin drugs. What? What? 
back to the history of statins, in 1990, there was an NIH panel convened to ask the question of whether lowering LDL in human physiology was a good thing. And their conclusion was, maybe it's not a good thing. Maybe we should be careful. Well, that was swept under the rug. Uh, and very few people know that in 2001, Bayer recalled a statin named Servostatin and has paid out over $1 billion to settle lawsuits related to serious side effects related to that statin from Bayer. A very interesting thing happened in 2004 in the medical research realm, and this was a scandal involving Vioxx. The pharmaceutical company behind Vioxx was found to be guilty of massaging data, of withholding data, and many thousands of people suffered cardiac and cerebrovascular events because this drug was not fully vetted and the negative side effects were hidden. After that time, increased regulations were placed on the way that trials are done, on the way that side effects are reported. And interestingly, as part of my research for this podcast, there is a real difference in the way that statin trials look in terms of outcomes before and after 2004. I'll show you guys a couple of graphics here in a moment, but what we find is that before 2004, statin trials made statins look like they were very effective for reducing cardiovascular disease. Statin trials after 2004 do not look nearly as impressive. And the problem with this is that when you look at statin efficacy in reducing cardiovascular disease or overall mortality, those are very important endpoints to consider, and they're different endpoints, we see that these meta-analyses will conglomerate all of the data over the last 30 years of statin trials. Well, as you'll see in a moment, data from after 2004 looks much less impressive than it did before 2004. But a meta-analysis pushes all of this together and we lose the details amongst all of the numerous studies that are being considered. This is the problem. This is a nuance of a meta-analysis that must be considered carefully. Though it's a good type of study because it's looking at more data, it is also mixing trials potentially of varying qualities. And I think that what we have to be aware of at this point is that historically, with the massive change in the way that studies were done and the way that results were reported in that amount of time, we must be very skeptical of this. So this is an interesting paper. <laughs> the title is Statins Stimulate Atherosclerosis and Heart Failure Pharmacological Mechanisms. It's from Expert Reviews of Clinical Pharmacology in 2015. Uh, the authors are here. The first author is Haruki uh, Okuyama. But from this paper, I want to point your attention to this graphic. If you're not watching on YouTube, this is probably worth looking at. So you can see here on this graphic that the secondary prevention trials are in purple, dark blue, and the primary prevention trials are in light blue. It's important to note that this 4S line up here um, is a secondary prevention trial. This is in the people who had the lipid triad of low HDL, high triglycerides. Earlier in the podcast, I mentioned that in the people who did not have low HDL and high triglycerides, there was no significant benefit from adding simvastatin. And I overlaid my risk on that, which is important to consider that I'm a primary prevention and 4S was a secondary prevention trial. But the point I'm trying to make here is that originally in 4S, if you didn't have insulin resistance evidenced by low HDL and high triglycerides, there was no benefit to having a statin, even in secondary prevention. And if you look at this graphic, before 2004, the trials definitely showed a significant improvement in cardiovascular coronary artery event ratios for secondary prevention and even for primary prevention based on LDL levels. But this graphic, I will show you an erratum. There's an erratum for this graphic, which I will show you in a moment here. The after 2004 graphic looks like this. And you can see here that these lines do not slope down Lee, nearly as sharply as the lines from pre-2004. In fact, some of these lines even go up, meaning that when you lowered LDL in some of these trials, like the C's trial, like Enhance, which was looking at uh, intimal medial thickness getting worse, uh, this is GCHF, which was all-cause death as the outcome, which got worse when you lowered LDL. Um, some of these go up. There's Illuminate. Uh, so these lines are a very different slope, going many of them either slightly downward or even upward, depending on the primary endpoints, relative to the pre-2004 studies. 
What we must question here is whether or not there has been shady reporting of cardiac outcomes in statin trials before 2004 that changed significantly. And I think that if you are looking at data regarding cardiac outcomes, intimal medial thickness, or all-cause mortality for statin drugs or other drugs that lower LDL in that graphic, we must consider these either post-2004 or pre-2004 because we know there is a difference in the way these trials were done, the quality of the trials, the quality of the reporting, and throughout all of it, no third party can actually get statin side effects because that's at the CTT under the watchful eye of Professor Sir Knight Rory Collins. Interestingly, and along these same lines from the paper from Marianne Damasi called Statin Wars, she says that in the case of statins, the vast majority of trials are sponsored by the industry. As I mentioned, Ronald Reagan, 1980, et cetera. Only one major non-industry funded study on statins has been done. It is the All Hat trial, the antihypertensive and lipid lowering treatment to prevent heart attack trial, acronym All Hat, which showed pravastatin had no significant benefit in reducing either all-cause mortality or coronary heart disease in primary prevention. That is the only one that has not been sponsored by the industry. So is something shady afoot here? I think we must be wary of that possibility. In fact, I think there's a lot to make us quite suspicious of that at this point. I want to get to actual levels of statin side effects in a moment. I want to talk about the health protection study. But before I get there, I also wanted to talk about the cholesterol guidelines and how these have changed over the years. As I mentioned earlier in the podcast, I did a reel on Instagram a couple of weeks ago about conflicts of interest in the United States governmental dietary guidelines. And what I found reading a paper that my friend Andrew Huberman had sent me, hat tip to Andrew, was that 95% of people who made those guidelines had industry ties. As I mentioned earlier, ILSI, et cetera. Well, what we find about cholesterol guidelines is very similar. So in 2000 and 2004, the National Cholesterol Education Panel revised the guidelines for cholesterol with no new data, but they lowered the level of LDL and total cholesterol that was felt to be acceptable and optimal with no new data, and many more people were then eligible for statin. It was later found that eight of the nine people on the NSEP, the National, the National Cholesterol Education Panel, had financial ties to makers of statins. Bullshit. What the heck, you guys? What the heck? It's corrupt. It just, how can it not be corrupt? Furthermore, if we're back to this paper from Marianne DeMasi, she talks about the fact that shortly after the UK's National Institutes of Health and Care Excellence, called NICE, announced it planned to have the risk threshold for prescribing statins from 20% to 10% over 10 years, doctors vigorously objected to the change. A UK survey revealed that two thirds of general practitioners would be disregarding the advice to offer statins to people at the newly proposed threshold of 10% on the grounds that it was not evidence-based, could lead to medicalization of healthy people at the cost of more needy unwell patients. Skepticism was inevitable once it was revealed that eight of the 12 on that panel as well had financial ties to manufacturers of cholesterol lowering drugs. What? What? I think pharmaceuticals are amazing. They've done so much good for humans. And the industry is corrupt. The industry is focused on money and we must be skeptical of this. They have benefits, but often the side effects are underplayed and we are not told of important side effects or studies are designed to minimize side effects. I've certainly prescribed medications in my life. I've taken medications in my life that have been helpful for me, but the pharmaceutical industry does not have a good track record and it continues to look more and more shady the further down the rabbit hole you go. Consider this article from the British Medical Journal in 2004. Scandals have eroded US public's confidence in the drug industry. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> I don't know if they really have, but in 2004, at least according to this article, only 13% of Americans believe that pharmaceutical companies were generally honest and trustworthy. That's 13% of people who are probably getting taken advantage of. But in this article, they talk about different scandals, different corruptions. Um, different problems involved in conflicts of interest here. Uh, this is a scandal coming 
uh, after a publication of a study from the center showing that authors of 13 of 163 articles published in leading U.S. medical journals had failed to disclose relevant conflicts of interest. The list goes on and on, guys. This is not uh, a new thing. This is not a striking thing. The pharmaceutical industry has many fingers and tentacles into lawmakers, and there are many conflicts of interest that are not being disclosed.